Hi everybody, I'm your friend with Jets, Justin Sullivan. For those of you who don't know me, my company specializes in operating, chartering, and maintaining a fleet of classic executive business jets, aircraft made in the 80s and 90s, refurbished with brand new interiors, updated with advanced avionics, becoming the workhorse charter aircraft that serve my retail clientele all over the world. The reason that some of the aircraft owners in my fleet find my model attractive is because of the relatively low asset acquisition cost of a refurbished jet. $9 million for a refurbished Falcon 900C, or $65 million for a brand new Falcon 8X. $3 million for a refurbished Falcon 50, or $25 million for a Challenger 350. But there's a big nuance to that calculus, and that's what today's show is all about. You see, it's easier and more straightforward to finance a new $30 million Gulfstream G280 than a $3 million Falcon 50 manufactured in 1994. Arranging financing on jets older than 15 years is considered specialty finance. That's where David Burke from Transit Capital Partners comes in. If you're looking to finance a classic executive business jet, you need an advocate like David to take you through the process. He has all the inside industry connections, the lending relationships, and years of deal flow experience to help qualified buyers navigate this process. David Burke can be reached at david at transitcapitalpartners.com. Welcome to the show. I started Transit Capital in 2015. I think we've done over half a billion dollars in transactions on every different um, you know, platform. I've managed to fall into that half a million dollar minimum um, because uh, like I have a, a gentleman right now who is buying a, um, it's a, uh, it's an older, uh, sorry, it's an older citation. And uh, he's buying it for like a million dollars, needs some work. Um, but that's his first plane, um, and he's using it for business. Uh, but he's the type of guy that, you know, three years from now, if he um, uses that aircraft in a manner that suits him, will probably come back and, and look at a, a different uh, platform, something that might be a little bit nicer, a little bit faster, a little bit longer. Um, and so you. Yeah. get a lot of repeat business too yeah, so, much, so many of our customers you know people who, who ended up buying a jet and you know upgrading to a to a 900 they came in with with you know a piddly new york to florida charter on a, on a beach jet 10 years ago and and built a relationship right. fell in love with the products so fell in love with with aviation saw how it it can transform yeah. their life and and um you know just keep keep as, as their lives have expanded they've uh they've the aviation has kept pace, you know, not always yeah. at the same pace. But. Yeah, my first client was a 601 and he upgraded to a Global Express, you know, like, and that's, that's not, not bad. And, you know, the, the part of being uh, in aviation is solving problems, you know, especially in the management side. And, Aircraft finances is a completely different animal with so many different moving parts and pieces that if you're really on top of things as the, as the finance, I guess, consultant, broker, place, or whatever you want to call that, you, you, there's so many things that have to come together that you're at risk for not completing the deal if you don't help coordinate all those things. So there's a fine art, art to it, as you know, um, that requires more than just, this is my lane and I'm going to stick to it. Um, some attorneys are better than others. Some banks are better than others. You know, it's and it's understanding how they operate that is the difference between being really successful at closing a transaction and just pissing your client off to the point where time goes by and every now and then somebody will miss a plane. You know, because the seller gets tired of all the shenanigans that the bank might be doing. So, so I would I would think that that kind of lends itself to th more things closing. You know, financing out kind of like like Mike did, right? Yeah, like any time that somebody has the ability, like Ted was an example, you know, he closed for cash and then we circled back with a, a loan afterwards. Right. But with transit capital, what we try to do, and, and you've seen this before, is we try to um, find five or six lenders 
that um, are going to be interested in the platform, are in the plane, are going to be interested in the client, um, that their underwriting will will have a positive outcome. And if we can get out of those five, three term sheets, then I feel like I've served my client's interest because we can then, um, you know, basically negotiate and have those banks competing for their business instead of us trying to solicit business from them. Good example would have been like Ted. Um, Ted had uh, three offers. One we banked, we 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 uh, we eliminated, and he was down to two. Um, and the one bank and um, uh, American Bank of, of Montana. I can use a name here, right? Yeah, yeah, that's fun. So you know they move a little bit slower, but they're the best bank in the world when it comes to servicing and after uh, the transaction is completed. And then we had another. Um, a company that wanted to do a financial lease, but um, at, when it was all said and done, um, the uh, Ted uh, got to have the banks, you know, solicit them for for the business, uh, which is a nice place to be where you're not chasing the bank, banks are chasing you, and that's kind of the platform. Um, this, my very first deal was uh, was uh, card check in Menon. Yeah, right? oh, another one. Too? Yeah. Yeah, that, those were back to back for the most part. You know? Can you walk my audience through what a deal structure looks like and what a term sheet would look like? A term sheet really requires, um, you know, a, 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 a commitment of some kind, um, a, a promise of another, which is which comes from the bank, and and then an outline for expectations of how things are going to go. Um, but I think it's also inherent in that is a responsibility for the person that structures the finance to put the buyer at risk a little bit so that everybody in the deal knows that this is a qualified buyer. And what I mean by that is that most of my term sheets will start off with a description of the, you know, the bank and the, the client and the aircraft and then it'll go into the advance uh, versus the, the uh, equity that they need to have in the loan. Um, then, uh, you know, the terms, which is going to be the interest rate, uh, the amortization and, and the term. And a lot of people don't, you know, we think that we they would know the difference between term and amortization and they're two distinctly different things. It would then go into some form of a penalty, what the bank fee would be. And that's pretty good structure, right? Well, what, what banks like when a broker comes in, um, if they don't have a system where they are taking a deposit that becomes non-refundable is putting the the the, the uh, buyer at some kind of financial risk if he doesn't live up to his end of the bar a bargain because you don't want to make it so easy for someone to walk away for something that the next best thing comes along and they shift um, because everybody's putting a lot of time and energy into it including the title companies attorneys inspectors appraisers etc right so and it kind of helps you qualify the deal on the upfront too, right? Absolutely. I, I want to make sure that I'm bringing to a bank a qualified buyer who understands the risk associated with entering into a transaction and is not going to get flaky and back out when everybody's marshaled some resources. Because even if the bank collects, you know, $10,000 or whatever, it's a good big deposit, they're marshaling some resources. They have expenses that might exceed that number and they're counting on that. Uh, transaction to close within their pipeline for that particular year and they budgeted and you want to make sure that they're going to call you back by running it by me running a tight ship you know and so sometimes the biggest negotiation involved is that little piece of the term sheet which is what the buyer's deposit good faith deposit and non-refundable deposit uh, will be as well as the uh, fee to me for uh, providing the service. Is it different on, on older planes versus newer planes? Like, cause Oh yeah, it, it's, it's, it's much different, you know. Um, on, on a newer plane, uh, you know, every bank is, first of all, uh, the older the plane gets, the narrower the audience with banks for uh, loans. That doesn't mean it can't be done, it just means you need somebody with experience that can do it for you. Uh, certain banks will have limitations like um, uh, 
uh, what is that bank in, in Texas? But they 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 will not look at anything that's uh, older than uh, 15 years right. or 20 years. Like They'll PNC, at, for example, is like that. What's that? Like PNC Aviation Finance, the, the, a lot of these big... PNC, PNC is a very good example. And, and though a PNC type of bank is for, you know, established relationship type borrower who is a re- relatively new uh, plane. Um, and I would stay within, you know, their sweet spots within 10 years of whatever our current year is. So 2022 would be 2012. Um, you know, they, they don't like a lot of hours on the plane. They insist upon engine programs and they have some very creative, uh, programs. Uh, some that have, uh, no recourse, uh, as well as full recourse as well. And it's a needle that just slides up and down based upon how much risk that they want to have associated with the economy and all these other things that might interfere in their ability to enjoy the plane, you know? Um, is that, is that a type of business other, that you, that you service, David, or do you do most, uh, Something else. I, I tend not to service the type of clients that are going to be in the PNC uh, realm. We like to have clients that have um, either not uh, a lot of experience in uh, financing aircraft or financing equipment, um, are too busy to do it themselves, or are basically jumping in for the first time. Um, because if, if, for instance, if you have a relationship with Huntington Bank and you're buying a, a five-year-old aircraft. Well, well, they'll provide financing for you because you're a relationship client. You're in their system, and they they already know they already know your risk profile, right? But somebody that might be a, a new buyer, like we've had some new Falcon 50 buyers, and they're uh, legacy aircraft. And when I say legacy, it's generally over 15 years old, yep. um, over 5,000 hours, that type of thing. You know, those are the more uh, interesting clients where you have to create a relationship with them, for them with the new bank. And so they're going to do a full financial profile, um, debt and income you know, schedule. They're going to want to know forensically, you know, uh, what the person's capital structure is and his willingness uh, to be able to, you know, make the payments and, um, you know, uh, service alone. Uh, they also want to know if it's an experienced, uh, um, you know, plain uh, user. Uh, if they, you know, have charter before, if they understand that marketplace, because, you know, uh, air, air, aircraft and, and cars and horses and all, all kinds of pretty things will invoke an emotional response. And what I try to do with my clients is get them out of the emotional response and start looking at the practicality of it. So one, I'm not wasting my time, but two, they're not getting into a situation that is really not suitable for them. Um, every plane, you know, buyer at some point goes through the glassy eyed phase. They look at that plane and they are coveting in it and they just have to have it, you know. And sometimes they get ahead of the curve on what they can realistically afford. Um, I've had, I had a couple of guys recently and they just didn't have the financials, but they insisted upon pursuing, you know, uh, I think it was a, the Falcon 900 and in the, the mid threes and uh, it, it, they just didn't profile on the front end. I tried to keep telling them that. I, I told them that I didn't think I was the right place for them to go to. And about four months later, the guy, you know, called me up, kind of complaining about what a waste of time trying to find an airplane was. And it wasn't about finding an airplane. It was about he didn't fit the aircraft. Uh, his financial uh, situation didn't fit what it was going to take to to adequately. Find, uh, you know, make the payments on, on, on the plane. Now, he may have been able to do, do that, but the bank looked at him a certain way, and they're going to run a, a screen, and you're going to fall, you know, somewhere in that risk profile, and you'll be able to afford, according to the bank, you know, uh, something within a range of value. It could be, you know, a million and a half and lower. It could be five million and lower. But they are going to spend enough time to, to, to do an underwriting on you and, and figure out exactly what kind of payment you can afford because they, they're not in the business of taking planes back. They, just, they don't want to do that. So they're going to make sure that they do. And a lot of buyers don't understand why they spend so much time in underwriting. It's because, you know, the bank has a risk profile that they have to assign to everybody. They have to report to, you know, their... Uh, regulatory agencies and uh, somebody from the uh, FDIC may come in, start pulling files, and if they're not looking at 
uh, clients, so the FDIC should think they should be running their their lending operation, then they start having um, you know audits and things of that nature. So uh, sometimes the bank is, is is a little loose with their um, underwriting because they know the customer and it's an easy financial uh, disclosure to review. And sometimes it takes longer because people have a lot of LLCs and businesses that uh, need to uh, be vetted. So, you know, for every plane, there's all kinds of different buyers. And it's just a matter of um, finding the right bank for the right uh, airplane owner um, and creating a relationship between them, you know, and that's part of what I what I do. I like to think of myself less as a financial, uh, a finance broker, an aircraft finance broker, and more of a aircraft finance consultant. Um, because you you have to really understand what it is that the client needs, what it is that the banks are looking for, and check all the boxes that are associated with completing the transaction. Um, you and I have had numerous types of attorneys. Some are good and some are bad. Um, we know the good ones from the bad ones now based upon our experience. Title companies, some are good, some are bad, some are vanilla. And if you don't have all those boxes checked as the, as the yeah, man, finance. It's that, that closing checklist of, of bringing all oh. of those disparate pieces together. And that's really yeah. you know, in, the, in the deals that, that we've done together. Um, you know, it's like herding cats, and, and that's yeah. that's where you, where you make your money. And and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna blow you up if you don't have um, your checklist completed, and everybody's not organized in a fashion that allows them to close in a timely manner. So, you know, it, it's it's a relationship business, as you said, and, and you and you build a certain level of trust because. Uh, what you're asking these people for, and they don't know you very well, is their entire financial, you know, history, and uh, they're sh- they're sharing things with you that I, sometimes I don't even believe they share with their own spouses, you know. Um, and so, number one, you have to be uh, um, you have to be very prudent in your disclo- disclosures, and you have to be very proprietary, uh, and. Uh, you have to build a, a certain la- level of trust um, in a very short period of time with people that are giving you uh, financial information that they sometimes don't even share with their own relationship. Back. So, what have you been finding um, as far as demand for the clients that you're serving? As far as you know, planes or their desire to charter. Um, you know, we've done several deals in financing, so I'm assuming that there's still some pretty good. Uh, inquiry for what I can, uh, what kind of money I can find, um, even on the people that aren't pulling the trigger and buying things. So I, I'm thinking that it's still pretty robust. Yeah, the market's really amazing. Um, I mean, that's that's what's driving this, this you know, buying spree of, of, of snapping up all of the inventories because they're feeling so much pain on the access side. You know, they're being told from net jets that there's a, a one-year waiting period. They're being told by wheels up that um, pr- prices are up 40% and it's a 90 day waiting period to participate, to book your first flight. Um, nobody's really happy. Nobody's happy with the, the prices they're paying, the service level that they're getting, um, the supply chains for parts, for pilots. Um, it's, a, it's a really tough, um, tough operating environment. Um, you know, what with on the airplane owner side, David, what we really see is so we operate kind of three tiers of, of plane. We've got um, late model Challenger 350s, a mid tier of Falcon 50s and 900s, and then a lower tier of the Jets. So, mm-hmm. you know, one of these Challenger 350s came to us recently, and we're we're hiring pilots for it. We're we're trying to get those pilots into flight safety. And we're looking at like a four to six month delay in, in getting those training slots for Challenger pilots. So without paying through the nose for contract pilots or paying through the nose for guys who are already kind of type rated, you know, so they don't have to go to training, they can at least fly the owner part 91 until they go to training and can fly part 135. Um, you know, above and beyond the, 
you know, having to buy the parts directly from the OEM. Um, it's just very tough to keep the, you know, to get the, and, and expensive, tough means expensive, um, to get these right. newer planes like in the air and, and, and get the owners using them. Versus Falcons, you know, everything is busy, but there's a very broad base of Falcon pilots. We've got dozens of them you know, in our, our, our purview as pilots in, in our fleet. And we're constantly in, in that, that network of, of and, and just there's so many more Dassault Falcon jets out there, um, you know, from the, the 80s and 90s than there are Challengers. And we don't have to compete with NetJets and FlexJet for pilots. Um, so, you know, we're much easier getting these guys into school, much easier um, getting parts, you know, the aftermarket parts marketplace for for Dassault Falcon Jets and Lear Jets. You, know, you buy parts for 20, 30, 40% of, of a, a factory new OEM part. Um, you know, just the, it radically changes the economics of, of airplane ownership. Um, and you know, with, with Falcon 50s, the, the, the TFE engine trick, right, where instead of running them on a, an expensive engine program, um, we, we know that we can go into that, that used engine marketplace and buy engines for, you know, an, an MPI engine costs $73 an hour, um, and you can routinely buy used engines for under 100 an hour. Um, so why anybody would pay 3x that for, for MSP, you know, the, the, I mean, you know, the reason that they do is because if you're buying a, you know, Gulfstream G280 or a Citation, you know, Citation Sovereign or you know, any later model plane, firstly, those engines are so proprietary and sophisticated that, um, you know, a shop visit can cost a million dollars, so you, you've got to keep it on those those programs, but, um, you know, you, you also want to protect the value of the plane, right? If, if, if somebody brought a $20 million Challenger 350, they wouldn't want me to go put 1,200 hours a year of charter on it, and they wouldn't want to take it off of an engine program because it would kill the, the residual value, right? But right. Right. if you're talking about a Falcon 50 that's 30 years old and, and fully depreciated costs all, all pimped out 10% of that of that Challenger 350. It's not the same plane, but um, it's a very different financial outcome. Um, you know, on the acquisition side, on the maintenance side, on the engine service side, on the the, the, the pilot side, you know, all these, these fixed and variable costs that um, we, I, I'm sure you know a few people who've bought planes and been surprised at the, the costs that are involved in running a flight department. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody, everybody thinks that it's an easy business, and it's really not. Um, the other thing that you know, uh, customers are surprised with is actually how much the long, how much the the the, the expense associated with the planes. You know that uh, it, those that enter into a professional management uh, agreement, uh, whether that be charter or just simple management. They seem to be okay, but those that want to go on their own and, and not hire the right people on the front end seem to be overwhelmed with the cost sometimes because they have re unrealistic expectations going in. So the guys that are buying planes and they're putting it with a professional um, company uh, like yours um, that are um, also having someone manage the plane for them if it's aside from chartering. They just have a better experience because they know what to expect. They're budgeting correctly. They know what the operating expenses are gonna be. A lot of guys that just go in to buy the plane, they're gonna fly the crap out of it, don't realize that the plane is a depreciating asset on an hourly basis. And what you're trying to do with the engine programs, and I have some lenders now that don't, don't need to have an engine program, because they understand that that's just a toss if they were to sell the plane and somebody doesn't pick up the engine program. And it's very expensive. Um, they're allowing um, an accumulated reserve uh, to happen. 
And the benefit of that accumulated reserve, which is so different from the interest programs like MSP and Honeywell and other, is that at the end of that term, that money can go with the owner, uh, pardon me, the, the seller once he sold it. And they can, can, the next guy can continue on. We even have situations where we have consumer financing. It's just a matter of asking the right questions on the front end. But, um, and, you know, hopefully people at um, MSP don't see this, but it's kind of highway robbery a little bit when, you know, you're spending on a Falcon 50, uh, you know, $900 to $1,000 an hour just for the pleasure of flying that. Well, and as you said, the alternative, sorry, my dog is like bugging me. Um, that's why I move around. The alternative is you put money in a reserve that accumulates, uh, and if you don't use it, you keep it, type of thing. I mean, you, you put it in there, assuming that you're going to have to use it at some point, but you, you're controlling that account, you're controlling that expense. It's, it's not something that's like life insurance policy. That but the thing with Falcons is that it's a controllable number. You know, if, if you're doing that right. with, a, with a Citation 10 or, or a Challenger 300, you know, not only are you taking the, the, is your asset taking a valuation hit by pulling it off of a program? but you still have a, a very significant liability when that shop visit comes due or if there's something unforeseen that happens. I think, you know, why we like the Falcon platform so much and frankly why we like Lear's because they, they all operate with TFE 731 engines. So it's so much more forgiving when you can just go into the marketplace and, and, and buy something um, when you need it and just treat it as an expensive part um, versus versus a, a, a cancer on, on your cash flow, right? Right, 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 yeah. And I, I think part of what I try to do on the front end, you know, getting more to that consultant um, idea, somebody, you know, is to make sure that they have realistic expectations when I turn them over to a bank, you know. Um, yeah, there are expenses associated with, um, you know, ownership of the airplane that's beyond just the financing costs. There, there is, uh, you know, soft and hard maintenance. You know, reserving for landing gear, depending upon where they are in their maintenance cycle, is a, is a good thing too, because those things can be relatively expensive. Um, unless you have somebody like yourself that can shop it around and um, and find a good deal based upon need. You know? um, there's a lot of things that. Uh, not just with you know maintenance and ownership of air, aircraft. There's there's a, just understanding you know the fina- I guess the financial um, um, a profile of what a airplane really is because it's basically an asset that has moving parts and pieces. You know you've got your financing component, but you also have your maintenance component. Right? And then, which is to a soft maintenance, and you have to have a reserve for other things that are um, more expensive. And I guess part of what I do on the front end with clients is get them to be realistic about what their expectations should be. One, so the charter company doesn't get blasted, the maintenance company goes, I don't know, you know. So sometimes the worst buyer is that new guy that's uninformed. And what we, what I try to do is I try to give everybody the bad news and yeah, the you're doom news. Gloom. It's not like bad news. It's just, it's just the news, right? So that they go in with eyes wide open, understanding that they're going to have to spend some money on upkeeping the airframe. But more importantly, if they do it the right way in three years, if they want to you know, switch out of something, then it's going to be a good experience for them. Not too many complaints. They took the wife and kids down to Cabo San Lucas and Cancun and Switzerland, wherever the hell they went. And now they're ready for something bigger, you know. And ultimately, I'm trying to create um, a pool of clients that come in and come out of the, uh, the the marketplace based on where they are in their life cycle, you know, or in their business cycle too. Um, the, the guys that had the the, uh, the 650 and then went up to the global, their business expanded, right? And so if you set them up on the right if you set them up at, on, at the beginning with the right uh, mindset of what the realistic expectation of an owner should be, what to expect, then there's no surprises. And the next time they go into the marketplace, um, 
if I've done my job and you've done your job managing the plane the right way, they're going to give us repeat business. And that's kind of what it's all about. We want to try and make our lives and their lives as easy as possible and have an experience in aviation that doesn't suck. Pardon my, my French. And we've run into those guys where they just had some bad information or they got into a bad plane. Um, and they, they did that a terrible experience. It's really difficult to get those people back into the marketplace, even if they have the financial acumen to do that. You know, So I, I always like the fact that you're full disclosure and you solve problems. Yeah, the, and, and kind of, I guess the last thing I, I on this particular conversation, um, maybe we can leave with is that uh, there's all kinds of different um, ways of treating that that aircraft purchase as an asset, specifically um, in depreciation. Um, and I, I can get in at another time to other expenses and things like that. But, you know, I wrote this article on, on uh, uh, modified uh, accelerated cost recovery, macro, which is a big thing. And a lot of clients will get into the um, aircraft business because it's a big asset with a lot of depreciation. And you'll get these guys that come in and, you know, they take that $3 million off in their first year and they're, they're just really happy. I just, I got to offset taxes by $3 million because I set up my LLC the right way. And that, we can talk about it, how we work with attorneys at another time. You know, I, 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 I set up the management contract the right way. I completely did it by the book. I wrote my $3 million off. And then you get a, a rising market and everybody sits there and goes, wow, I can take that $3 million plane and I can bang it out for $4 million, right? So boom, without even thinking about it. And then their accountant knocks on the door a little bit and says, hey, you know, you know that $3 million that you took off? Recapture. You know, unfortunately, unfortunately, you spend a lot of time traveling this year, you don't have that much income. So not only do you owe the $3 million that you originally wrote off, because we have to recover that, because you couldn't depreciate it the whole way, now it's $4 million, but you got a million dollar profit on that plane at, you know, 28%, you got to pony up not only the $3 million that you wrote off, but the $280,000 that you owe now is what you sold them. So there's other things that uh, plane owners that are unsophisticated need to be aware of when they manage um, the financial parts of their aircraft as well as the, the physical parts of their aircraft, you know, and, and avoid, you know, the financial calamity by, by doing the wrong thing, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the sake of, of uh, depreciation. Yeah, that's a, that's a very excellent point. You know, one, one of the things I think that makes this market different, David, is that the planes are worth more to the owners than they are to, to they, they'd rather have the plane than the money that they can trade for it because the next right. thing that they would want to trade into is going to cost more than this because the market is, right. is, is, is so skewed and everybody wants planes for, for the same purposes because they... They need safe passage for their family and for their their business associates, and and you know right. that's that's why the market is so crazy because nobody wants to sell. Right, right, exactly. Nobody wants to sell. So, well, thank you for having me on. Uh, I'd love to keep this going. Um, hey, we man, should, uh, do it again. Yeah, well, absolutely. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, great Take work. Care. Bye.